Welcome to Darshan Talks, powered by the Kulkarni Law Firm. This podcast explores the challenges and opportunities facing FDA-regulated companies. Join us as we discuss the latest trends, news, and insights with experts and executives in the field. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. I'm here with the ever-popular, the ever-smart, John Malgian Esquire. And you know the Esquire is important because you know that's how you know that he's important. Um, But... But uh, I'm here with John. John's actually a uh, patent lawyer and an intellectual property lawyer. There is a difference because not all intellectual property lawyers are patent lawyers and vice versa. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about John's background. We'll let him uh, sort of give us more about his background. He's been on before. Um, but our goal today, ideally, if we get to it, is talking about the role of intellectual property in mergers and acquisitions. But before we get started, John, tell us more about yourself. Great. Well, thank you for having me back, Darshan. It's always a pleasure to be on your podcast. It's been a while since we've uh, we've had this talk. But uh, so uh, John Malge and I've been practicing intellectual property law exclusively for probably since 1995, so the past 27, 28 years. Um, I love it. My background is electrical engineering. And then I went on to law school and uh, determined that uh, this is the area I wanted to practice law, which includes, as you mentioned, you could be a registered patent attorney, and then you could also do intellectual property law, which which added to the patent law aspect is trademarks, copyrights, unfair competition, and then other things relating there too. So, so John, um, one of the things people always discuss is this idea that um, you, you need to... It, you and I have worked on multiple uh, mergers and acquisitions. We've always talked about the importance of uh, getting your intellectual property right. Um, there, <clears throat> there are now this, this emerging bundle of rights. Uh, everyone talks about – I'll let you talk about what the traditional bundle of uh, intellectual property rights are. But I also want to talk to you a little bit about how that's evolving. So um, I'll, I'll first let you sort of tell us what the basic bundle of rights is. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then I, if I may, I'd like to tell a quick uh, anecdotal story about how important it is to involve intellectual property attorneys in a merger acquisition at all times, whether or not you think you have a high tech company or not. And especially for your audience, pharmaceutical companies, it's imperative that there's intellectual property attorneys involved. So the, the big buckets of intellectual property are patents, trademarks, copyrights. And then from that flows a whole host of questions and issues that might arise during mergers and acquisitions. And then on the ancillary side is URLs and or and or domain names, um, trade secrets, uh, things that you don't think about until you actually get into one of these mergers and acquisitions. So and I'm just sure as a quick, <laughs> I, I do have a few others, actually, and I'll talk about those in a few seconds. But l- let's talk about each of those just as a basic um, you're getting involved. Well, it's it's funny to me. I'm actually doing a talk in a few weeks, and um, you would think that intellectual property would be top of mind. It's it's a contract negotiation um, event, and we're talking about preparing the next generation of contract negotiators in the context of uh, clinical trial negotiations. And the, the, we were splitting up the topics in a typical what's called clinical trial agreement. And mm-hmm. no one wanted to touch the, the section on, on intellectual property. And I find that bizarre. Like, if you aren't familiar with intellectual property or aren't comfortable talking about it as much, we have a problem because that is like the entire, that's the entire ballgame. So I think so, from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk to me a little bit about, you talked about the three basic ones, which is trademarks, copyrights, patents. Um, I see it. See each of those being misused. People are like, oh, I got to get my copyright on my logo. And you're going, wait, what now? Um, so what is each one? Yeah, so hey, to your point before, you know, CROs, it's very important for CROs to have their IPs in order because whether they like it or not, IP is being created around them during these tests, during the um, uh, the sessions and, and uh, uh, trials. Um, and, and I represent a company that does just that, CROs, and then they – and then they gather data after the fact. So, and there's all sorts of intellectual property surrounding that. So patents cover ideas or inventions or systems or methods, processes. Um, copyrights cover the expression 
of an idea or what we call a work of authorship or creative work of authorship. And trademarks cover the source uh, identifier of a good or service by way of the trademark. Uh, so those are the three main categories and what they cover. Trade secrets come in there as the beginning of a patent, perhaps. Um, if you have an idea or an invention, uh, you as a employer can, can consider holding that back as a trade secret and not applying for a patent. Because if you apply for a patent, the quid pro quo is you have to disclose the idea eventually to the public. If you keep it a trade secret, you do not. Now, the question is, how do you keep it a trade secret? It has to be something that most likely cannot be reverse engineered. Otherwise, once it's out there in the public and someone can figure it out, it's no longer a trade secret. I have a question. Do tr does trade dress even apply to the pharmaceutical industry? It can. It can. Sure. Uh, I will give you some examples. Um, I don't have the case law to back it up to name it, but uh, we're here for a nice casual conversation. But exactly, you know, uh, trade dress can cover. Well, let's talk about what trade dress is. So trade dress is a form of trademark. Again, it's a source identifying intellectual property right, meaning if you use a shape of a package or a or a product itself, it could actually identify the source of those goods or services. So the classic example is the old shape of the Coca-Cola bottle. That's a classic trade dress. If you if you remember the shape of it, um, if you see a cola inside there, you're going to think that's coming from Coca-Cola, not Pepsi, not RC Cola, et cetera. So in the pharmaceutical area, it could be the shape of the pill. You know, and, um, it could be the color of the pill sometimes, believe it or not. It could also be certainly the packaging, how they package it, the color scheme they use, the size of the box, the, the you know, the type of lid they use. There's one defense to, to trade dress protection. It's functionality. So when I'm when I'm talking about shapes and sizes of the packaging or products, the one thing it cannot be is functional. If it's functional, that's preventing others from using the same shape. Uh, to, to produce their product because they need to as a, as a function of the product itself. Um, medical devices, same thing. If a medical device, apart from its functionality, is shaped in a certain way and it starts to identify that product uh, uh, to a particular source, it doesn't, you don't have to know the source. You just know when you see that product, it comes from a particular source. That's trade dress protection. So it's interesting. We John, you've come on before. We've talked a little bit about trademarks before. I believe we've talked about copyrights. I know we've talked about uh, patents. Yep. We haven't really gotten into trade dress. Uh, for me, from a pharma perspective, the things that really speak out to me is um, I, I think Pr uh, Prilosec used to be the purple pill. That was their big tra trademark, but really it was a trade dress. Um, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm trying to give examples that I just thought of as you were talking. I was like, huh, th those are probably it. One of the famous ones, um, really going back, and, and this generation of pharmacists may not even remember, but um, Valium used to have a V in the middle of it. That's right. And, yeah. and one might argue that, well, isn't that functional? Here's the question. When does, what, what constitutes functionality? And what I mean by that is in that particular instance, one of the things you have to do is, in the pharma industry, as, as you know, John, um, you have to say that, your bioavailability is the same as the brand name's bioavailability. Right. The moment you put that V into your tablet, you've made it really difficult to copy the bioavailability because the release rate was different. I remember that there was this whole issue that a bunch of generic companies tried to do it and they just couldn't get that release rate in the same way. Therefore, they couldn't get their same bioavailability. Now, my question for you is, and again, you haven't done the research on this because I'm raising this off the top of my head, but could someone argue that that release rate makes it functional as opposed to the V, which is more of a look and feel, if you will? Yes. Based on what you're saying, uh, absolutely. That would be a classic example of functionality in your, in your space of pharmaceuticals. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's interestingly, I didn't know that that happened with the V and, and having it not be uh, the same bioavailability, uh, bio uh, but that's that's an interesting thought. Yeah, it, it's basically, um, I'll give you an example maybe that some folks can appreciate. If you think about the, um, 
if you're cooking out, uh, summer's coming, right? So people want to barbecue. And if you think about the Weber barbecue, it's, it's yeah. a lamb shaped barbecue uh, shell. Um, that was an interesting case on trade dress because uh, the question was, do you have to have it shaped that way in order for it to work better as a bar- outside barbecue, you know, with, uh, with uh, coals? Um, it's funny because the uh, during the litigation of this case where Weber was suing other people, the owner of Weber went on, you know, this is folklore, but he went on, on to stand and said, and they asked him, uh, you know, do you need it to be shaped this way uh, for it to function better? He goes, yeah, of course. It allows the air to flow better around it. Well, he lost his case by saying that <laughs> because, it, you know, it wasn't the shape that they were just doing it whimsically. They did it because they wanted to have a better flow of air around them around the uh meat or, or vegetables that were being uh that were being barbecued so so the shape of things like a weber uh, grill um if it's functional then the whoever came up with it at first may not be able to protect it at the end of the day um so you know the, the really functionality is is there's actually there's a sub to functionality it's called aesthetics functionality which i'm not sure if that's prevalent anymore in the case law but there used to be aesthetic functionality which is you know we have to compete effectively by making it look like yours because that's how we can sell our product that seemed to have lost favor recently in the courts because the courts are like well it's not you know it, the person who started it shouldn't be penalized from uh, being able to continue to use the shape because they were the first to innovate that shape um uh, so aesthetic functionality is a little bit different, but but actual utility functionality is still alive and kicking and should be out there because if someone has a shape of a pill, for instance, or the shape of a box or a shape of a pill container, and it's and it's needed, for instance, to be able to open it easier, you, you can't stop the rest of the world from competing with you in that regard, unless you have a patent on it, which is why we have patents and design patents. So we'll have to get to design patents in a little bit, but um, so let's let's explore that because I've never actually had a long term like a, a longer discussion about trade dress before in the life sciences. But here's my question for you: When you talk about aesthetic functionality, how do you if you connect it to this idea of puffery? And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but in the in the advertising world, uh, and John, please excuse me if you are familiar. This is for the people who are um, not as familiar, if you will. But um, in the in the advertising world, you're allowed to say certain things that may not meet the strictest definition of those words. And and I guess my, my question would be, if in the case of the Weber Grill, for example, you said, um, you know what, the the we have the best airflow, which is the, which is sort of what happened in that specific instance. Um, you can lose the case. How do intellectual property lawyers prep or work with advertising people so that you don't have exactly this issue? Because in your case, in, in the Weber case, and again, it's it's rumors and it's whispers, but um, the, the CEO's comments were used against him. But do, have you seen situations where IP lawyers could have prevented this exact type of debacle because someone could have pulled up an ad and said, you say in this ad, um, this is this has the best airflow. This has the best bioavailability. And tell, talk to me about how you work with, with uh, people. Absolutely. If, 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 if folks on this podcast remember our trademark discussion, it's similar. Let's start with the basics in trademarks because trade dress is just a subset. So in trademarks, you're – we are always advising our clients to not use a trademark as a descriptive term, as a noun, rather you want to use it as an adjective. So similar to that is when you're using, when you want to promote trade dress, the death knell of trade dress is functionality. So like, like similar to a trademark, if you use it as a noun, you're genericizing or making it descriptive. You don't want to say anything about the functionality in your advertising, um, laudatory puffery or what have you. Uh, and the reason for that is it's exhibit A. Uh, you you said that this was functional. And I'll give you a, a real life example. I worked on a case years ago. It's published. It's the TMB versus Panduit case, and it dealt with cable ties. And uh, 
T and B, our client, um, had a cable tie with a rounded head. It was actually a barbed cable tie with a rounded head, oval head, I should say. And pa uh, Panduit had a square head. Okay. And for years they were competing. They were comp competitors. All of a sudden Panduit comes out with an oval shaped barbed cable tie. And the barb means the thing that locks in to keep the cable tie from, from being loosened. Um, there was a lawsuit that ensued for years, six years, and it, it all came down to whether or not TMB touted the oval-shaped head as functional or as distinguishable to the source of goods. Um, and so, yeah, it comes down to that. And so when we were in the litigation, you had to make sure that your client is not touting the oval-shaped head as, look, it's easier, it doesn't catch on things, because it's oval versus square, uh, it fits better in certain situations. If all that was out there, we never would have had the case we had. Um, it really was a whimsical decision on the part of the TMB company to make it an oval shaped head. Even if it was easier to manufacture because it was an oval shaped head, it's functional. And someone else, some competitor should be allowed to make, again, unless it's covered by a patent or a design patent, someone else should be allowed to make the same shape of the oval shaped head if it's easier to manufacture or it doesn't catch on things or what have you. We have a lot more to discuss, but just wanted to give a quick reminder that this podcast is powered by the Kulkarni Law Firm, making compliance easier. Visit us at KulkarniLawFirm.com. Now back to our conversation. So what happens in this situation where you're talking about you claim something? So so let's take exactly that type of situation where you claim that this oval shaped head is is the the bee's knees, if you will, going back to the 1950s. It, uh, it's, it's, it's the... Wait, how old it's are the, you, <laughs> <laughs> reading a lot of I'm doing podcasts and quoting the 50s. There's something <laughs> remiss about this. Uh, but... but uh, See? So, so you says got, that IP can't be fun. It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> I think IP is amazing. Uh, I love IP, personally. Um, <laughs> but I, I sound very Trumpish when I say that. I love IP. I love the IP. Uh, and I don't mean that in a disparaging or encouraging way. It's just a non-political statement. But uh, I have to clarify that every time. Um, but anyway, so we're talking about um, said functionality. And we're saying that this thing has um, – I, I like the Weber grib, grib, uh, Weber Grill example. And the reason I like the Weber Grill example is so simple to sort of visualize for me at least. Correct. So um, this idea that there's airflow and the airflow is better with our thing. Theoretically, could you have done research that says the airflow is not better? We're just claiming this because it's puffery. It makes us look better, but we don't actually have proof that it's better. So if someone comes back and says, no, 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 you made this claim. Can you pull out data saying we made the claim and you could probably go after us for misbranding or mislabeling, but you could not actually win a case on functionality? Possibly, yeah. Be, huh. meaning, meaning the functionality that you claim really doesn't exist. So therefore it's not functional to have it that shape. I can make that argument. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Have you I ever like seen that. anyone well, try we're, that? We're going deep. I hope your folks are still alive and, and awake out there. <laughs> uh, well, if they're enjoying this as much as I am, they probably are awake and taking notes. Good. Um, but Great. let's, let's explore something different. What, what we kind of explored with this was this idea that, um, we are talking about how to avoid getting into trouble. Let's let's use that same analogy, and we're talking about getting ready for a merger. You've got a situation, you know that in the next five to seven years, you want to be ready for a merger. You, you know that you're a small biotech, you're a small medical device company. You know in five to seven years, you really don't want to be the company that's selling the product because you just don't have the resources for it. How do you prep someone to be set up so that when the time comes for a merger and acquisition sort of process, um, they're ready for it, they have their ducks in a row? So how do you advise these companies? Great question. And I'm going to defer a portion of my time to you because a lot of it has to do with FDA approvals and, and putting your ducks in a row from that perspective. If you want to talk about that today, if not, absolutely, I just def, you know, defer the, 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 the audience to, to have a, 
chat with you on that because as you know you and i work well together on that and and there's so many issues in that area but getting into the area of strictly intellectual property let's break it down into the buckets again let's start with patents first thing you want to do in actually in anything relating to intellectual property you want to see who owns what um so if you're a small uh, pharmaceutical company in your scenario i'm, I'm, I'm gonna st- I'm going to stop you for a second before you even start. Would you actually start with having a general counsel? Or do you think a company can do this on their own? Like, how early do you start contemplating this? In the, in the inception of the company, you should have this okay. in order, right? Because okay. it's like anything else. If you're selling a car, but you don't know you're going to sell it for five years, you either keep it maintained or you don't. And it's always better to maintain the car, whether you're going to sell it or not, because it gives you better pleasure and, and, and it's better to drive and all that stuff. So, um, again, I'm biased, but I have seen situations where people did not get their ducks in a row early on. And it, it's a mess to, to un, undo it later on. And it's probably going to cost you more money. Right. Pay me now or pay me later. Right. Um, so, yeah. So so if if a company is starting, they should reach out to you and I and have us set them up properly. And, and we have, you know, a very reasonable way to do that. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's worth the investment. Let's put it that way. And, and, and so what I would say to them now, if they're starting versus, as well as when they're about to get uh, acquired or merge, it's the same advice. Make sure that anyone who works for your company uh, it, it, it will assign their rights over to the company of any intellectual property. End of story. So in the employment agreement, I call it an employment IP agreement, have language in there that talks about it. When we, when you get hired in exchange for your, us hiring you, you agree to. And the agree to is assign all right, title, and interest in into any intellectual property that you may create on behalf of the company while you are employed for the com- you know, with the company. That's the nicest thing you could do because then everybody knows um, – everybody will have – Assign, agreed to assign their rights over to the company. You have no issues with ownership. If later on, which oftentimes happens, you don't have those agreements in place, you have to backpedal and figure out how to get those done and signed and have consideration for them. Um, now that branches over a bunch of IP buckets, but you know patents are important because in the United States, at least whoever invents is the fir- is first the owner unless they've assigned it or agreed to assign their rights over. So even employees will own their inventions unless they agree to assign it over to the company. Um, so have that in place. If not, we could do that retroactively, of course, if the inventors cooperate. Um, trademarks, not an issue with ownership as much as are your trademarks in order? Have you protected them? Have you filed for federal registrations and all that um, to making sure that those are in proper position to be acquired and merged because we're talking about intellectual property here but if you think about it it's very analogous to real property and assets in a company i i don't distinguish between physical assets and intellectual property assets they're all on the same literally on the on the on the balance sheet as an asset and they should be valued and the more you the better you protect them in in the most proper way the higher the value they'll be um, so ownership is a big issue in the beginning. When it comes to copyrights, even a bigger issue of ownership because if you're an employee of the company, fine, the company by operation of copyright law will own the uh, copyrights that you create. But if you're an outside consultant, you own it. And so a lot of times companies will have software people writing code for them and thinking they own the copyright in the code, but they they don't. They, own, they may own the source code, they may own a copy, but they don't own the the actual copyright. So if you go to merge, you have to take care of that problem. Um, and then trade secrets, similar to patents. Uh, so that's the very first question is ownership in my, in my approach. The next is what's going on with this intellectual property? Uh, have you properly harvested everything you could from the company? Have you applied for patents, trademarks, copyrights, meaning apply for a patent, a copyright registration, a trademark registration federally, um, if you're an international play, have you gone out outside the United States because all of these intellectual property rights are territorial for the most part, so you'd have to apply for and receive patents, trademarks, copyrights outside the United States. That's a lot of work, and, and that should be done early and often in a company if you want to build that asset class. Um, 
So in a merger, it, it, this is great segue, in a merger acquisition where someone approaches us and says, we need to do due diligence, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to see whether or not people own what they say they own. And we do that by way of looking at databases for assignment, you know, assignment recordations and all these other things. And then we look to see what are the assets you actually, IP assets you actually have. So we ask them for a schedule. If they don't have a schedule of IP assets, we go and they look, we go and look for them. Most of it's public. The patents are public. The trademarks are public. The copyrights are somewhat registrations are public. Um, we look for trade secrets. You know, we're basically looking under the hood and trying to see whether they've missed something. And if they have, we try to make corrective action or we let them know that, you know, they may have lost this or that asset. Most of the time we could, we could take corrective action after the fact. Again, it, it's probably cost more, maybe somewhat cumbersome, but we can do it. What are we trying to do? We're trying to make the car look as best as we can before we sell it and before it gets acquired or merges. Um, because the people on the other end who are going to acquire or merge are doing the same thing. And so we're, we're really trying to make sure that everything looks great for the sale. It's like, again, the analogy is like staging a house, right? Stage the house, you'll get much more for it than if you didn't stage the house. It's, it's interesting you talk about the traditional pieces, the, the uh, patents, the copyrights, the trademarks. One of the things I think you and I have been getting more and more involved in as we do a lot of these transactions is number one, and, and I want to add to what you're saying as opposed to sort of uh, you've kept it, and, and I appreciate it, you've kept it at the 101 level, but uh, you and I have been working at this 501 level, if you will, in some of these cases, um, where we're talking That's about cool. things like, <laughs> uh, we're talking about things like patient data. Who owns the patient data? Because one of the things I find myself getting into arguments with is you are right now, uh, and this is going back like 10 years, but everyone said data is the new oil. Question is, who owns the oil? Does the patient own the oil? Does the uh, pharma company own the oil? Or does the, um, the, does the hospital that got the patient data own the oil? Now, one of the interesting things that pharma companies say is, and, and I'll see this pretty routinely, we are not HIPAA compliant because we don't actually have the data. Question is, if you don't have the data, do you own the data? If you don't own the data, what is this worth? Because in the end, this entire thing in the pharma world is based on the data you actually got. Um, and that gets into issues of data privacy, data security, and cybersecurity, et cetera. Um, the other question becomes... Uh, and we, we just talked about patient data. There's another whole piece on um, application data. So you're applying to the FDA. You've got all your documentation together. You and I were involved in something like this uh, previously, uh, going back a little bit, um, where the question was, who owns the data submitted to the FDA if right. we want to make changes to that? Right. And one might argue that, well, you own it via copyright. Yeah, try telling someone that and try to find that. It's, it's one of those harder pieces of information. Um, and, and that becomes easier, I guess, if it's a quote-unquote willing transfer in that the person's trying to sell you something. Um, if you've got a situation where someone is dead or the company's defunct, um, that becomes a lot harder to get. Um, another, another question that you and I have gotten more and more involved in has been pharma companies getting a lot of this data and then building software around it. And, and the question becomes, pharma companies were never in the business of developing software. Suddenly, we all think we, in pharma that we're software developers, except they don't really have the knowledge on how to perfect their IP. Um, so, so I guess part of my question, I, I guess I was, that was both a soliloquy where I talk about this overall, but I was sort of adding some color to what you're thinking about. Um, but I, I, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, oh, the other pieces that I think are coming up more and more as you and I deal with this are things like URLs. You mentioned URLs a second ago, but do you also own your LinkedIn page or does LinkedIn own your LinkedIn page and you have a license to use it? Um, because, because LinkedIn says that you can't share passwords. Well, whose account is that LinkedIn page tied to? And that adds all new levels of complexity. Um, so have you, for example, let's say we've got an employee 
Uh, we know this employee is going to let go once the merger happens. Um, but that employee created the LinkedIn page. Do you have a way where you've, con- where you've had this conversation or talk to these people to go, yes, you control a LinkedIn page. You need to give us control. You can't remain owner off this IP anymore. Because I don't even know if LinkedIn has a way of doing that. Do you? I'm not aware of that. It's it's a messy situation, like you said, because it's it's gosh, I hate using this term organic, but it's it's it, it organically starts out as, hey, you know, let's set up a LinkedIn page. So, you know, we're in the nascent stages of things like that. Uh, I just happened the other day with uh, Instagram, uh, you know, someone had an Instagram page and now they're, they're an influencer and then they're trying to like kind of sell their influencer platform, right? Because they have so many people watching them and they have to deal with those issues. But I, 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 I gotta be honest. I don't, I've never dealt with the LinkedIn issue. I've dealt with URLs and things like that, but I, I guess you'd look at the user license agreement, the EULA with, uh, with LinkedIn or Twitter or, or all these these outlets, social outlets, um, to see what you can do. I, I would assume that uh, you could possibly, you know, if the employees willing to work with you, have that transferred like you would a URL. Um, but I'm not sure of the process, to be honest. Fair enough. Um, so we we barely touched the surface on this, John, and uh, we sort of did a deeper dive into. Uh, trade dress because it was a cool topic to jump into and no one really knows what it is and you happen to be one of them. But before we go, John, first of all, how can people reach you? Oh, they can always reach me at uh, my uh, firm, Stevenson Lee. Um, I'm in the Princeton office of Stevenson Lee. Um, They can reach me at uh, 609-718-0979 or they could email me at John period Malgin, M-A-L-D-J-I-A-N at stevenslee.com. Awesome. John, thank you for coming on. I hope we can have you back to discuss a continuation of how to prepare for an IP merger, for for a merger, and then maybe get into how to actually execute in a merger and then even post-merger conversations. So, so John, thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you, Darshan. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Darshan Talks. Remember, the information we discuss is for educational purposes only and is not legal advice. For additional valuable insights and updates, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter at darshantalks.com. Darshan Talks is powered by the Kulkarni Law Firm.